It's Greg James. Listen carefully. Listen. If you haven't already, switch your phones off or put them on silent. And also turn your flash off, okay? No flashing. Safety first, fun second. Here's the BBC's motto. Finally, please familiarise yourself with the nearest fire exits. Sometimes, you know, they say on aeroplanes they might be behind you. So I suggest you look, just look behind they you. Might. They might be in front of you, but they also might be by the side of you. Seriously, these people, these people aren't stupid. I apologise if you are stupid. <laughs> anyway, have a look around. In the event of emergency, it's every man for himself. Run as fast as you can and trample over it. No, no, no sorry, no. Uh, do look around. In the event of emergency, follow the instructions from the stewards. Thanks for listening. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the flight, the day, the academy. Enjoy the academy. This is BBC. BBC Radio One's Academy. One. Thank you, Greg James. <laughs> Grab my knife. So hello and welcome to Radio One's Academy. So this session is all about telling stories in the digital age. It's a must for any of you who are, want to be journalists, bloggers, writers. And over the next hour, you'll hear from journalists and editors who are here to tell you about what it's like to be working in some of the biggest news organisations doing news in 2016. So at the end of this session, hopefully you guys will be better equipped to find, investigate and tell stories. And of course, you'll get the chance to ask questions as well. So don't be shy. Okay, so let's introduce our esteemed panel. First up, it's Newsnight's top news hound, Evan Davis. Baby, this is what you came for. Story, so She's the investigations boss at BuzzFeed UK and an award-winning reporter in her own right. Welcome to the stage, Heidi Blake. <laughs> Music journalism isn't worth knowing, quite frankly. Please put your hands together for Sam Wolfson from Vice UK. And <laughs> my colleague Anna Dover, who works at Newsbeat Online, is running a bit late, so she will come and join us when she appears. Now, believe it or not, all of us in here are storytellers. So whether it's online, on your phones, social media, or if you're with relatives and friends, we're all sharing and reporting on things that happen around us. These guys on stage make their living out of storytelling, but before we ask them how they've become so successful, let's look at what they do best. I still haven't got the answers that I want. You just lie. If I am you're not giving me a direct answer. Well, it is a direct answer, is it? Can you be trusted when you can't be loyal to your own brother? I'm not ducking the controversy. You don't know if it's going to happen, you don't know when it's going to happen. I'd just like to know more than you're thinking. When Seth Blatter announced to the world that Qatar would be the host of, of the world's biggest sporting tournament, there was palpable shock. I've never worked on a story with, with this much evidence involved. Telephone logs, bank transfer, and enormous cache of very explosive documents. We did feel fairly cut off from reality. It meant completely leaving our lives behind. You said you, you want dome rotors to stop making cars that break down in a few years. Like, you carry like so they can mess up all of them. Well, do you yeah. really believe that cars are made to break down? What, built in obsolescence? Yes. Yeah, I believe okay. built in obsolescence, don't you? Well, you I, did, I, I tell you what, when we were kids, when I was a kid, was a kid people made deliberately <laughs> any one of us. We went on holiday. <laughs> we could barely <laughs> guarantee to get back Much more tactile than the Jeremy Geese. The cars were so unreliable, they have become much more reliable. Because, 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 and I sort of think the companies that made obsolescent well, cars think, went out of business. You think that, do you? Well, I honestly think that. I posit that as at least a theory of capitalism. One of Britain's biggest fraudsters, I accumulated between 10 to 30 million pounds. So Rice and the Chinese can make a fraud was as easy as that for me. Everyone was saying to me last night, oh, where have you been? Where have you been? Where have you been? I went, no, I haven't. Impressive stuff, I'm sure you'll agree. Yeah. Um, and I saw you covering your face at one point there. I love watching that back. <laughs> That actually got a lot of hits uh, on YouTube. You know, that's one of my most painful memories on YouTube. It was only about my fifth week on the programme, and they said, oh, you've got, got Russell Brand. <laughs> but the other interesting thing about that was, it, what, what, the old media world is very lumpy. 
you know, Newsnight, 45 minute programme, um, that was scheduled to be an eight minute interview and then we were gonna to go to a film for seven minutes. And after four minutes, they said in my ear, this is so good, you've got to, we're gonna keep it running. So it was live. Yeah, so it was live. But they can't like extend it by two minutes. You either dump the film and then you've got to, you've got to run it for the whole of the seven minutes that would have been there for the film because the technology is kind of, it's really fixed. So it was either going to be eight minutes or it was 15 minutes. It couldn't be anything in between because there was nothing to go to apart from the film. And once you'd done the film, that was... What was your reaction at the time when you were told? Um, no, I was like... Uh... <laughs> yeah, <just> don't do this <laughs> No, no, I mean, because he was shouting and uh, no, it was... It was, it was... Well, I mean, it was... Uh, there was one point where I tried to show him a graph to get him to comment on it and he said, I don't want that graph! <laughs> What's a graph? Don't give me your graph! <laughs> and... Uh, the audience were on my side on that afterwards. <laughs> What's great about this panel, hi Anna, Hello. thanks for joining us. Nice it's to be here. here, is that you've all got very different roles and you've taken very different routes to get to where you are now. Heidi, let's start with you. How did you get your first break? Um, well, so I, uh, I started out working for my student newspaper. I was at university in York um, and I kind of like knew that I wanted to be a journalist mostly because I thought I wanted to be a poet and my mum was like, that's ridiculous, <laughs> anybody doing that, go be a journalist um, instead because you can still write and it's a professional job. So I kind of, that was my thinking, but I then joined the student newspaper and just totally fell in love with journalism and the kind of camaraderie of being in a newsroom and chasing stories and trying to cause trouble for the university and feeling like we were kind of representing the students um, in their like, battle against the corporate greed of the vice chancellor and all of that sort of thing. Um, and so it was, uh, that was really what kind of got me interested and kind of gave me the bug for journalism and got, helped me to develop a portfolio which I then used to get a job when I left university. And then your route was a bit different. No, my route was, um, and I will be coming back to this in everything I say, my route was I studied economics basically and I worked in economics. and. My route in was that the BBC actually wanted people who understood economics to report on economics. Uh, it was a kind of novel idea at the time. <laughs> and um, sense, they were really struggling to find people. And um, so my route in was really coming in as an economics correspondent. So I had my little specialist subject and it meant I circumvented what were the kind of traditional routes into journalism. I didn't have to go through local radio or newspapers. It was, it was much more about the subject and then I was kind of thrust around trying to work out how to be a journalist rather than being a journalist per se. So but you, it did, get, it, it, you have the specialism first. Yes, yeah, yeah. And that did mean I'm not a very good journalist because I've never really understood what that entails. Um, but it gave me a huge advantage because I had my own protected patch. And it meant, you know, I was king of my little pile. And that, that, that was, it just, that's always given me job security and a kind of a sort of a place in, in the BBC that was, I think, it'd be much harder if you don't have anything sort of the, the, that marks you out from all the other people who want to be, be in journalism. Sam, you're executive editor at Vice, a job I'm sure many people would like. How did you get there? Um, I, I guess I sort of took advantage of my youth, at least initially. I think my first thing that I wrote, The Observer, were doing a sort of teen issue uh, and I wrote a thing for that, and pretty much that led on to everything else. You know, other journalists saw it and liked it, and for a few years they thought that I was like a trendy person who knew what young people were into, even though really I was just listening to Coldplay. Um, <laughs> but that headlining really, a big weekend. Headlining a big weekend, still very young and trendy. Um, <laughs> but I agree with Evan. Like, while I was doing all that and getting bigger commissions and and uh, working for lots of different publications. I went to university and just did a straight politics degree and while at the time sometimes that felt very weird because I had essays to do and then I'd like jump on a train and come somewhere and interview someone at a club night till 4am and then go back and do some more essays. Uh, now that I'm in a more sort of general news role it's unbelievably useful to be able to uh, you know, just be able to quickly read an academic paper and find out where the story is or know how to kind of find experts quickly and, and do those kinds of sort of more academic interviews and how that then turns into journalism. Um, so yeah, that combination I think is always very helpful. So in contrast to Evan, you started very early. 
How do you go about writing your first article? Many people, I know I, but 15, 16, wouldn't have dreamed of being able to have something published for The Guardian or for NME, for example. Mm. I think one really good thing about getting into journalism is that the barrier for entry is basically nothing. Like, we at Vice take on new writers every single week, like someone that we've never met, don't know anything about, no background check, comes with a really good story and a great angle on it, and we just, you know, trust them and get them to write it and see how it goes. And I think that that is, you know, obviously, <laughs> To have a career and to you know get specialism and all of that stuff takes a long time but the key thing is having a great story or having a great angle on something and i think that often people kind of email us and say hey i want to get into journalism and that's not really a very helpful thing and it's also not a very helpful thing to say hey i want to write about music or i've listened to this album and here's my review of it because if you're just starting out you're probably not going to be the best person to do that but if you say hey i'm a person living in glasgow and all my mates are becoming UKIP counsellors, and this is something that just happened this week, which is why I'm on my mind. And it's a really weird thing, and I didn't think that anyone I knew would ever become a UKIP counsellor, and now all these people are doing this. That's a great story that we didn't know about, that you know, we're sat there looking at them, and I think that that then creates a relationship, and, and now that person is commissioned to write that story. So I think it's finding good stories, and then going from there. And knowing your patch. And knowing your patch, absolutely. Anna, how did you start out? I know we work together now, but you've worked in different places. Yeah, sure. So if I were to look right back, um, rather geekily, when I was 15, I was chosen to interview Norman Lamont for my school magazine. <laughs> you don't know who he is, he was the Chancellor of the Exchequer a long time ago. So obviously, it's just trying to work out myself how I started doing this. I was interested in writing words, interviewing people, finding out the truth about things all that in, in a school sense. I don't think the interview was the most hard-hitting he has uh, been through in his career. So anyway, a few years later, I uh, applied to do a broadcast journalism degree at Leeds University uh, in the era when those sorts of media degrees were a little bit scoffed at broadly. But um, I fancied it because it was different to all the kind of regular essay writing, academic stuff I was doing obviously for my A-levels. The idea of doing practical um, training, learning how to use cameras, do radio, go out and about, that really appealed to me. So I went for it, uh, and it was a really fun three years, really enjoyable. But going back to Heidi's point, the thing that really got me in was doing the student newspaper. And now, ironically, my tutor on my course said, you're doing a bit too much of, of, of the paper, you need to do more of your GCSE and your course. And I was like, how can you be putting me off doing actual journalism like with a real audience? And, and in those days, we were student, you know, it was a printed piece of paper that had a big circulation. So I ignored her. Um, it turned out okay. Uh, I did lots and lots of uh, music journalism at university, particularly. And just as you've both, as everyone sort of alluded to, I met people there that are still in the industry now. And I, you know, they are the beginnings of your, your network, your contact. People that you know can do things and help you find, you know, contacts and stories. And, and just, just that kind of practical experience of laying out pages at three in the morning in a student paper, listening to Radio 1 actually back in the day. Uh, it was Scott Mills as well that was on those night shifts. It's <laughs> strange to think. So yeah, so that was really good and really inspiring and fun. And I got to meet a lot of you know, interesting people, um, you know, in a way more glamorous than maybe today. I remember sitting on Moby's tour bus outside Leeds University and um, drinking beer with, not him because he was too total. But anyway, so just fun things that get you really into the idea of of interviewing people and all that stuff. So that's how it began, and then from that course, I got work experience in a local radio station, became a local reporter, newsreader, and worked my way through commercial radio, and, uh, and ended up, you know, sort of online and, and doing stuff at ITN and now BBC. A lot of people in the audience will be at the point where they're choosing a college to go to or a university. Do you need to go to university to get into journalism? That's such a good question. Can I have a go at that? Because I actually, basically, I think you, you're not going to learn much at university that is going to help you, is my guess. However, I, I think, and I put a finger on it, it's networking. Honestly, you meet people at university and you, um, you kind of try things and you bounce, you, you kind of you basically just interact with other bright people at the same stage of life. And I think you learn a lot about yourself and what you can do. Uh, and you learn about it in what is a relatively safe, consequence-free environment. You know, I mean, apart from the consequence of loading yourself with 
fifty thousand pounds worth of debt uh, as you leave. Um, you know, you can you can be in the student newspaper. You will find out whether you can write or whether you're actually just not very good at that. Uh, or you can go onto the radio station and find out that that's your thing or not your thing. Uh, and you will find out also. You will meet people who you will be friends with and associates with for the rest of your life. And my I have college friends, who I was also involved in the student newspaper, I have friends from that student newspaper who I'm still involved with, one went on to be the science editor of the Daily Telegraph, one is quite a big chap at ITN, you know, and I mean, these, it, 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 it's just very, very useful, basically. Less for what you know, more for who you know. Are there any particular subjects that help, though? In my case, you know, initially it was a no, I did computer science and law, and I'm a journalist now, but it was my, like Anna, it was my journalism masters that again, was probably most useful because of the contacts and the work placements I had at the end of it. Well, I, I'll come back to my favorite theme, which is I think it is worth having a special subject um, of your own. And I think that's good for two reasons. One is it helps you have something to write about or to talk about in journalism. And the other is, if you're not going to make it in journalism, you've got a plan B because you've got something else that you can talk about or you can something something else that you're an expert in. Um, I so I think <laughs> I, I actually really do think a good thing to do is to is to is to study something and to uh, and, and to become kind of you know a bit specialist in something. So university does help with that, uh, and that may be like it was in my case with economics helpful to your journalistic career. But I, I do say I do I do think in general university is useful for a whole gamut of things, quite apart from the subject. Heidi, do you agree? I do agree. Really. Um, I mean, I, th I, think, I think you don't have to go to university. Like, I think if it doesn't appeal to you and you'd rather just get stuck in straight away when you leave school, then I think there are all sorts of ways of doing that. Um, you know, and as Sam says, you can just start pitching and, you know, like knowing your patch and pitching stories that are kind of that are around you and that works. But I think university is just tremendously good fun, and um, really, honestly, it's even if you end up in debt, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's it's you know it's some of the most fun you're ever going to have, and you're going to meet such an extraordinary range of people, and um, and as Evan says, you know, you get to try out all sorts of things, and it's kind of a costless exercise. Like you can just turn your hand to you know a bit of journalism or a bit of amdram or whatever it might exactly. be, mm -hmm. you know. And if you fail, it doesn't really matter because uh, you know everyone's a bit of crap because like, everyone's an amateur, and so it's sort of fine. But actually also you know it's a way of meeting all sorts of people who are really passionate about the same things that you are so you know my very best friends are people that I met at the student newspaper at university and most of them have gone on now to work as journalists so you do have a network um, and you can you can I mean the other thing that's great about it say, say as a journalist is that if you go work for a student newspaper you are a bunch of kind of 19 year olds who are in charge of you know a 44 page printed publication and you know which everyone in your community is reading including all of the people who are in charge of you so it's actually a kind of microcosm of what it's like to be a journalist at a national paper where you know you hope that the prime minister reads your story and that it re reaches a wide audience like at university the vice chancellor the people who run the university are going to be paying attention to the student paper and all of your mates are kind of going to read it and be interested in it and that's, so you get a real taste of what that's like, but you have enormous control over the product in a way that you're not going to have again for a long time in your career until you get much more senior. There's a really good chance to just have a go at actually running the show and seeing what that's like and kind of figuring out where you want to go from there. Do you think student newspapers are as relevant today in 2016 in terms of getting experience? I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm to, I'm, I left university in 2008, so uh, unless things have changed dramatically since then, it's definitely been very useful for me, and we have people kind of coming through all of the time, and probably because of, I, yeah, I, I, end up, I suppose you end up looking for people who you identify with in some way. When people approach me to talk about jobs, um, I often will kind of take an interest in candidates who have an interesting student newspaper portfolio, because I think, well, that shows that you you know, you got stuck in and you kind of turned your hand to it and, you know, if it's, if it's a good portfolio and I know they were doing that with limited resources, you know, not much support at university, then I kind of think, well, that's impressive. That's really impressive, yeah. I would say, though, maybe this is slightly controversial, but don't do an undergraduate degree in magazine journalism or fashion journalism if you want to work in magazines and fashion. Do an undergraduate degree, that you like to say, in a specialism, do a master's in journalism. Those, both of those things are very useful and help you learn the skills that you need and learn the things to write about. 
But if you want to actually just work in the magazine, it's much better to take an internship at a magazine or just try and freelance and like do three years of magazine journalism, which is, I think, not that helpful. And the people, on, you know, the, if you look at the rate of people who come off those courses and get jobs, it's normally within the industry that they want to get jobs and it's normally quite low. Um, so, and you know, you can always work on a student learning newspaper and well, um, go on. Do you want to? I was just going to well, obviously I've already alluded to the fact that in, when I did my course people thought well that's not really the route in and that, you know, lots of those headlines are reader degrees not worth the paper they're printed on and all that. I have to say though, whilst I sometimes look back and think oh, I could have done politics or something, uh, I meet people all the time in, in, in a newsbeat now, there are three people in the room who did my course at sort of years either side of me. It, that, I don't know, it might be just a lucky course, but that broadcast journalism course certainly has sent people straight into radio and telly. Um, so, you know, I, yeah, if I had my time again, I might, I might, I might take that advice. But and going back to the point about does student journalism still matter, it's a shame so many have gone online only, but, you know, we live in a digital age. I have to say, from a perspective of making news every day, about 16 to 25 year olds primarily, we get stories from student newspaper websites, which wouldn't have happened unless we'd been incredibly organised and had batches of papers being sent to the office, and then it would have been too late. You know? So we often pick up stories and ring up student unions and stuff to get stories that have been published first at student level. What were the biggest challenges when you started out? Ooh, um, yeah, well, I, I was always a broadcast journalist. I've never been a, a press journalist. And for me, actually, writing is quite difficult. I'm, I'm, I'm better in verbal communication. Um, I think for me, one of the biggest, the biggest challenges has always been boiling things down to the kind of the constraints. Every job, right, has constraints. And in a lot of jobs, it's the money, the budget. You know, if you're an architect, you're designing a building to a budget and you can't do what you want to do because it's going to be too expensive. 